Welcome ladies and gentlemen, today we're going to look at a whole new nation, a whole new set of ideas. These guys are known for their extreme innovation with tanks, of course, having made the Magak from the American main battle tank and the Shotikal from, of course, the Centurion main battle tank. But today we're not going to talk about either the Magak or the Shoti, we are going to talk about the M50. I will maybe also somewhere later, either this week or this month, upload another video which is called the M51, which is basically the bigger brother of the M50. Uh, if I would have included everything about the M51 in this video, which was on the table, uh, this video would have become way, way, way too long. So we decided to make two videos about it and yeah, that's that's why we did it. Anyway, um, both these tanks, so the M50 and the M51, are sometimes referred to as the Super Sherman. And the Super Sherman is actually a name given to it by a newspaper from around the time. So in official documents, it isn't actually called the Super Sherman, it's just called the M50 or the M51. The story of Israeli tank ambitions actually began before Israel was even a nation back in January 1948. And this is because they tried to buy 50 T-17 E1 stackhounds, but this, well, eventually led to nothing. But once it became apparent that they had to start fending for themselves, they started to buy some older World War II era equipment. And one of the most common things they bought was, of course, the Sherman tank. The first formal purchase, I'm saying formal because they bribed a couple of British officers to get their first actual M4 tank, but the first formal purchase they got uh, for the M4 tanks were 30 M4 105mm. But funny enough, these uh, M4 105mm weren't the first tanks to be converted uh, to the M50. The first tank which was converted to the M50 was the M4 A4T. And this one was only bought in the early 1950s. The idea to create a very powerful Sherman version arose back in the early 1950s. And this is because they started to look at other tanks. So one of these other tanks is the Amex 1375. They were impressed with its main armament and with its mobility, but not so much by its protection. So they started to think, okay, what can we do? So the idea eventually arose to put the 75 millimeters of the French in a Sherman and that eventually was a success. The first tests for the M50 were conducted back in 1955 and it proved to be a failure. I mean, there were a lot of issues and these issues were eventually ironed out and towards late 1955, it eventually was accepted by the Israeli Defense Force. Early on, it proved to be a very formidable vehicle, of course being used in the Suez Canal crisis, only the Allah version and from the Six Day War, Onwards, it was only the bad version, and it was used in three major wars under Israeli command, at least. So that was the Suez Canal Crisis and the Six Day War, which I just said, and of course the Yom Kippur War in 1973. But of course, like most other tanks, eventually it's not strong enough to keep up anymore with the new stuff, and it gets phased out of the army. This happened back in 1974 to 1976, and then eventually it gets given away to, for example, the South Lebanese, or it got sold to Chile. During its service time, the M50 went through some changes. For example, the Israeli changed the suspension system from VVSS to HVSS. The way you can spot the difference between the two is when you look frontally at the tank and you see the tracks of the M50 bed has two tracks. That means that it uses the HVSS system, while the M50 LF only uses the VVSS system which looks like a singular track. However, this isn't the only difference between the LF and the BAT versions. They also use different engines as well, with the LF using a 400 horsepower R975 engine uh, and the BAT using the 460 horsepower VT8 engine. It's kind of odd when you realize that the Israeli also never actually upgraded their Sherman tanks armor. So, for example, if they just got a uh, M4 Sherman with 18mm of armor thickness and they would convert it to either the M50 or the M51, they wouldn't make the frontal side or rear armor any thicker. And this is kind of strange because they never actually even had the Sherman 
which for late World War II era standards was still penetratable. So when you're arriving in the 1950s, 1960s and 1970s, that armor isn't just going to hold up, which was a major weakness, of course, of the M50 and the M51. Now, another thing that didn't change was the crew layout. So you would still have the commander, the gunner, the loader, the driver and the hull gunner, which made up a five man crew. When looking at its operational usage, we can see that it had seen quite a lot of action, of course, uh, from the Suez Canal crisis until the end of the Yom Kippur War, at least under Israeli command, after that in the South Lebanese Civil War as well. But for now, we'll mainly focus on the three wars, the three Israeli wars. Now, uh, we know, I just told you guys, that in late 1955, it eventually got accepted um, by the Israeli Defense Force. So by the middle of 1956, only 25 of them were ready for action. And these were all stationed in the 27th Armored Brigade. During the Suez Canal crisis, the 27th was sent to engage the Egyptians in the Sinai Desert. And this is where they achieved excellent results. They had to engage T-34 85s, uh, archers, uh, they had to engage uh, M4A4, s M4A4 FL-10s, and this is also where they captured a dozen M4A4 FL-10s, and they also captured a dozen uh, M4A4s, which either were put into service as M4A4 or were made M50s and went into service like that. In the Six Day War, the M50 once again was used. 100 were sent to the Sinai Desert, 100 were sent to Golan Heights, and the rest was kept in reserve. There were other fronts, but they needed the firepower elsewhere. Now, coming to the Sinai Desert, uh, the M50 encountered one of their old rivals, of course, from the wars before, the T-3485, but they also had a new opponent, and this opponent was the T-54. And to make it even worse for the M50, it was in a hull down position. But keep in mind, by this time, they already had the M48s and the Centurion tanks, and some of them were even already outfitted with a 105mm. In addition to all of that, the Egyptians actually had a couple of SU-100 versions still in the rear, but these were not used during the initial combat. Now, during the first hours between 3 a.m. and 7 a.m., the Egyptians actually lost about 60 tanks and already 2,000 manpower. Uh, meanwhile, the Israeli only lost 19 tanks, and uh, 11 from those losses uh, were actually due to minefields and not due to anti-tank fire or due to uh, tanks or other tanks, you know, and so on. Now, when the field marshal found out they were losing this much, he ordered a retreat, so that was about uh, 30 kilometers away from the Suez Canal. But even their attempt at retreating was bad, because it was done in a highly disorganized manner. And when they were retreating, uh, most of the time they just left their fully functioning equipment behind. Now, when the marshal found this out, he ordered to stop retreating, but most of the troops uh, ignored that actually and just retreated anyway, apart from a couple of solemn cases. However, it wasn't all rainbow and sunshine for the Israeli either. They had actually run out of quite a bit of fuel, especially for their Centurion tanks. So when the Egyptians were attacking with T-54 and T-55 tanks, the task of fending that attack off went to the light tank battalion and these tanks were only the uh, AMAX 1375s. So they had to uh, start fending off the T-54 and T-55s oncoming to them and as you might expect especially with such little armor it turned into bloodbath for the Israeli. Uh, not a single T-54 T-55 was actually destroyed by the AMAX 1375s. But what they did do was they bought the uh, M50 and M51 tanks enough time to reinforce them on the flanks and knock out a couple of T54, T55 tanks. The T54 and the T55s were forced to retreat in such a way that they were forced to Ismailia. I don't know how you say that, but that's that. Uh, and there they encountered 12 Centurion tanks, which didn't show mercy. And yeah, that was that for them. Um, in the end, the Egyptians lost 700 tanks and the Israeli only lost around 100, 
of which one third was recoverable. On the Jordan front, six M50s arrived and they were immediately greeted with fire and one of them was actually put out of action due to the fire of an M48 tank. Now, all of these M48s were in fixed positions and had additional fuel packs or tanks on the side of their tanks. So when the M50s were able to flank them, uh, quickly six of the M48s were on fire, so they decided to retreat. But in their retreat, uh, they lost about 11 more tanks due to mechanical failures. Further, north, more M50 and M51 tanks were engaging M47 tanks under the cover of the night, and the battle went eventually on for several more days, but due to the fact that Jordan had largely uncrained truemen and that the Israeli had a lot of air support, they were at a massive disadvantage there. On Golan Heights, the advance was mainly being charged by the M50 and M51 tanks. And these guys were basically split into two columns and they were charged with attacking the Kala stronghold. I'm not sure if you say it like that, but there you have it. Now that stronghold was supported by another stronghold, which was basically firing uh, support artillery fire to help that other stronghold or Kala out. Now, this was a very confusing time for basically everyone because one group accidentally went uh, charging at the stronghold who was uh, giving support fire. The climb to the top was uh, of course hampered by the artillery fire, but it was also hampered by concrete and the tank obstacles. Now, of the 20-ish Shermans which tried to get to the top, most of them were eventually knocked out by anti-tank fire and only three-ish made it to the top once everything was said and done. There was also more fighting going on at other strongholds where actually even the Panzer IV tanks were used, uh, but these were eventually also silenced. Of course, like always in war, also like I previously said, not everything always goes according to plan, and this was also the case once again. For example, 28 armored vehicles, including 9 M50 tanks, went accidentally the wrong way and were all knocked out. Near the end of the Battle of Golan Heights, 160 tanks didn't see the end of the war, uh, which did too eventually were recoverable, but 127 men did not see the end of the war and, well, gave their lives on the battlefield. In addition to all of this, they also saw service during the Yom Kippur War. Now, uh, I also want to thank all of you for watching. Most of my information I got from a very good friend of mine. Uh, if you want to check out his website where he has a lot of pictures, he has a lot of information and, uh, and so on, you can do so by going either to my description, going to the comments or just checking out the link I have here on the screen. It will be also there. Uh, thank you very much Minus for helping me out with that. Other than that, I got a video on the left, playlist on the right. I would like to thank VW German Looker and Sander for being members of my channel and I'll see you guys in the next video. Goodbye.